Social movements dating back to the 19th century have been part of the histories of democratic societies. To borrow from Todd Gitlin, social media have allowed the whole world to watch communities of people push for civil rights and democratic reforms. Just what has been, what is, and what will be the role of media in the changing the world's political landscape? That's the question on this edition of World Press. Whoever controls the media controls the mind, Jim Morrison once said. Is he correct? I'm Tony Fellow, Professor of Communications and your host for this edition of World Press. Throughout history, the nation has seen race and sexism at the center of many social movements. But many would not know the significant role that the media have played in helping social movements not only get their start, but also get it pushed to the forefront of the nation's agenda. Today's World Press takes a deeper look into the past, the present, and the future sectors of the news industry, and how various news entities have been able to affect various social and political movements. First up, we take a look in the past, where World Press reporters Brian Klein and Luis Anguizula investigate two very pivotal movements throughout the mid-1900s, the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Rights Movement. The American Civil Rights Movement was the first truly modern social movement. It was the first in American history to utilize technological advances in communication such as radio and television. Using these media channels, movement leaders were able to create a singular national cause behind which hundreds of thousands of Americans would rally. I spoke with Dr. Leslie Matthews of the Cal State Fullerton African American Studies Department to understand how marginalization and the media spawned a massive civil rights movement. The 1950s was a time when African Americans were experiencing the just real onerous effects of the Jim Crow uh, informal policy. Sometimes Jim Crow were laws that dictated the way that African Americans could engage institutions, they could engage with uh, non-blacks, and then in other ways they were informal. Like other social movements, it began small, little ripples that develop into waves, which then come crashing down into sort of the mainstream consciousness. You had some pretty savvy African-American leaders and uh, activists who began to get their messages into the mainstream media, when previously, although this was very effective, their voices had been kind of uh, primarily coming through the African-American press. It was sort of a dual strategy of, let's see what we can do in uh, uh, negotiating with public policy, and let's see what we can do to disrupt or persuade others to our point of view. One of the defining moments for the movement and the media was the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Marching to the National Mall, black and white civil rights activists demanded equal rights for all citizens. The strength of that movement was in getting people, African Americans and their supporters together in the place of power uh, to say, we've got to bring about change. The media immediately flocked to the Capitol to cover the event. But what made the march unique was the role of radio, which let listeners at home experience this historic event in real time. The march culminated in Dr. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King's speech was not only significant for its rallying cry for African American civil rights. Instead, it set in motion a decade where all Americans, man or woman, Latino or Asian, white or black, would challenge every status quo in the search for equality, freedom, and the American dream. When we let it rain from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. 
The civil rights and the women's rights movements were two of the first nationally broadcast social and political movements and set the stage for many others to follow. Coming up after the break, we take a look into the present state of the news industry and the role that it has played in some of the most recent social and political movements in today's society. The flu? Isn't that just for old people? No. Especially not this year. With the H1N1 flu virus, teens and adults under 25 like us are at higher risk of getting sick with the flu. That's why I'm getting vaccinated. I'm getting vaccinated. I'm getting vaccinated. I'm getting vaccinated. Vaccination is safe. It's the best way to prevent the flu. And protect myself. My family. My roommates. My friends. Get the facts at flu.gov. Together, we, we can, can all fight, fight the flu. My joints ache so bad, I wake up in pain every day. I want to know why. I want to know why my hair is falling out. How did this happen? How did this happen? A little pain in my knee. That's how it started. That's how it started. This rash on my face, now it's like my body is attacking me. I want answers. When you don't have the right answers, it may be time to ask your doctor the right question. Could I have lupus? And of course, it's equal, equal rights. Equal rights to have a job, to have respect, to not be viewed as a piece of meat. Equal rights to, uh, to set forth our own humanity. Equal rights to get into graduate programs, to get into schools, to training programs. We're the bottom third of the employment in terms of pay. We represent, nonetheless, 34% of the workforce, yet we're the first to be laid off and the last to be hired. There aren't frivolous demands at all. We just want what men have had all these years. World Press reporters Ali Dori and Ariel Carmona take a look into the present state of the news industry, the election of President Barack Obama and the re-election of Iranian President Mohad Ahmadinejad are a few of the social and political movements looked at here. Journalists and political scientists seeking to cover and analyze social movements have not been shorted any opportunity in recent years. The 2008 election of President Obama and the taking of the Senate and Congress by Democrats propelled many conservatives into the Tea Party movement. In 2009, a questionable re-election of Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad sent more than 100,000 protesters into the streets of Tehran. A year later in the Middle East, the world witnessed the onset of the Arab Spring, a series of unrelated multinational movements which toppled the authoritarian regimes of Egypt's Husni Mubarak and Libya's Muammar Gaddafi. But it failed to ch affect change in places like Bahrain. Back in America, the 2011 Occupy Wall Street movement was born when those dissatisfied with the global economic system headed an anti-capitalist Canadian magazine's call to protest in New York City's Wall Street financial district. Social movements always aim for far more than they want, for, than they get, rather. And the channels of influence are um, foggy. Okay. So what we saw from Occupy was a change in rhetoric. And people started talking about inequality, and Democrats made some gains in 2012 and President Obama was reelected and the sort of fixation on the deficit that had dominated politics from 2009 to 2011 dissipated. Okay. Now, did that remake social life in the United States? Did it end capitalism, which some people who in Occupy wanted? No. Is it enough? No. Is it significant? Absolutely. What social media do is make organizing easier and in some ways cheaper. So when Tea Party started, local groups formed through Meetup. Okay. For Occupy, they, um, as soon as activists came to Wall Street, they took laptops with them and portable Wi-Fi and were able to broadcast their own message. Now what this means is Activists used to be dependent upon mainstream media to get their messages out and to inform others about their activities. And this is a, a tough road. Mm -hmm. So if you're waiting for the New York Times to say what you want about your movement, then you're very vulnerable. A common theme to all these modern phenomena was the increased use of social media so much so that the Iranian movement earned the label of Twitter revolution after Iranians communicated organizational information like protest settings and reported to the world examples of authoritarian abuse used to smother protests. 
Realizing social media's significance, Tea Party members in 2013 launched their own social network called the Tea Party Community, which had more than 50,000 members joined before it officially launched. Well, Occupy and many other movements are no longer so dependent upon the mainstream media. They can get their own messages out. The downside is the message goes out to people who tend to already agree with you. Right. And we have a more polarized society as a result. A Facebook page honoring the death of Khalid said, a man beaten and brutally killed by Egyptian police proved to be a catalyst around which millions of Egyptians eventually rallied to overthrow the government of Hosni Mubarak. Due to its efficacy as an outreach tool, social media helped expand the revolution to different segments of society, from students to professionals, men and women. Revolutionaries were able to aggregate easy-to-access commentary on a common platform. Recording video footage and uploading to share played a pivotal role. The world saw what was going on in real time. So in order to maintain media attention from uh, media that are not owned by you or organized by you, you have to keep doing stuff. You can't get attention just by saying stuff. And it's hard to get people to keep coming out and rally or um, sleep outside. And it's particularly hard for a group like Occupy because police also want to stop you from doing stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, so attention is contingent upon activity. Activity is hard to keep generating. And first of all, it's hard for your own people. And second of all, it's hard when it's confrontational. The recent movements have had successful and unsuccessful results. After deposing yeah, Mubarak, new unrest has since occurred Colonel in regard to his replacement and other government-related problems. The Tea Party is still underwhelmingly represented in comparison to Republicans and Democrats. Upon the 2009 death of Michael Jackson, media began to report less on the fizzling Iranian Twitter revolution. Over time, the Occupy movement lost active protesters as well as media coverage. As we approach the third anniversary of the Occupy movement, University of California Irvine sociology professor David Myers says its legacy remains unclear. I think social media are tools that activists can use. They don't determine outcomes. You're um, even moderately connected. You get appeals for action all the time, most of which you don't respond to. And um, it's a mistake to substitute the tool for the uh, cause or the, you know, the vitality of a movement, but it is a valuable tool. So, you know, it used to be if you wanted to get your message out to people who already agreed with you, you were knocking on doors or using telephone trees. Yeah. Now it's one blast, you know, through a listserv or even better, just posting something on, on a web. People can find out and self-recruit. Yeah, but it's still hard to reach people who don't agree with you. And it's, you're still dependent upon more mainstream actors working on your behalf. World Press reporters Elizabeth Simons and Jasmine Lowe look into the future of the news industry and how the ever-changing technology can affect the current growing social movements. The assorted movements throughout the Middle East, Egypt, Syria, and Ukraine have been covered by a number of international media outlets. But how will the publicity of these movements be affected by the fast-changing technology of today's society and news industry? Elizabeth and Jasmine take a deeper look. Cairo, the capital of Egypt and the largest city in the Middle East and Africa, has always been a center of the region's political and cultural life. For centuries, the city has been associated with the ancient world, but the present-day city in its terror square now serves as the focal point of the 2011 Egyptian revolution against the former president Hosni Mubarak and one of the major and first of many uprisings echoed through throughout the world through the tool of online social media. Cairo's people took to the streets with resistance through labor strikes, civil disobedience, marches, and demonstrations. However, the entire world was able to watch and participate in the planning of the revolution from smartphones and behind computer screens. From January 2011, to February 2012, the world watched and uploaded instant video footage to the web. And on February the 11th, with at least 846 people killed and 6,000 injured, the people of Cairo were able to see Hosni Mubarak resign from office. 
With their success being publicized all over the internet, many more cities and countries all over the world were able to be inspired to speak their minds and rise up in protest. I've heard about what's going on over there, but I have not followed the story, so I'm not familiar with it. Um, I think it's good that people are sitting in um, videos so we can get a first-hand look. Um, it's really good like when the, the bombings or like if something's happening in an airport, like you know, things that we need to know right away before going there or um, being around it, we can get alerted and avoid it. Um, but sometimes people are quick with those you know, videos and it makes us um, react like overreact, but I think uh, overall it's a good, it's a good thing. I think that's a, that's an angle that not the media sometimes can't get. I think it's actually really good. News coverage and the successful execution of social movements have always relied on the hope that what was important was getting out there and being heard. No matter what the medium happens to be, or how time shifts and changes the technology used to spread the word, the concept remains the same. There are those people who want their message to be heard, and there are those willing to help them tell the story. If they tell it well enough, then there are those people out there in the world that will take a moment to listen. And now for our roundtable discussion on social media, we have Jasmine Lowe, we have Brian Klein, and World Press reporter Ali Dory. And let's begin, Jasmine. Can you have a social movement today without media? No, you, I don't believe you can have a social movement without media. It's such an integral part of the movement itself. Without it being broadcasted to the people and um, creating that awareness out for that people, it, the movement doesn't exist. It's just an issue. And what does, uh, how does media validate a social movement? It not only you know, provides the knowledge to the people, but um, it distributes the, the core of the movement itself, the, the essentials that the movement is standing for to the people. It, it puts a name to the movement, so to speak. And so really, me, you gotta have media to have a social movement today. And we've had a lot of social movements, and we found that uh, most social movements have to go to extremes to become news. And as a historian, why don't you give us some background of some early social movements. Yeah, throughout American history, social movements have always had extreme action take place before the news really caught on and became common knowledge. Uh, the colonial period, you had uh, extreme action skirmishes and massacres in, uh, in Boston taking place before awareness got out to the other colonies. You had, uh, with the civil rights movement, you had media excuse me, media disseminating information uh, through television, through radio, and through newspapers to get the message out that there were people being oppressed and that there were people oppressing those other people. It would have been interesting to see if, if, we, if we can think back to the colonial period, particularly with the, as the start of the American Revolution and the fomenting of the revolution, which was brought about by the press at the time, and these town criers of uh, colonial America, if they had Twitter. Could you imagine if uh, Benjamin Franklin was able to use Twitter or um, in, if television was there? Uh, because they had a tremendous um, uh, amount of activity going on and, they, and look what they did just by word of mouth, basically, uh, in these coffee shops of, uh, the, of colonial America. And uh, Ali, um, what about, um, how do we measure the effects of these various social media networks uh, and are they to be successful? Well, one, a couple of things we can't measure mm -hmm. are if the, social, if the movement was successful or not based off social media. We can't measure if the movement would have occurred if not or for social media. We, what we can measure is how social media mobilizes people. Uh, we do know through research that it is an effective tool for mobilization. It sends out organizational messages. It makes people gather. It relays distress signals. It relays uh, you know, demonstration locations. It, so there's a lot of value in it. But whether or not movements are successful because of social media, we can't tell that. Uh, 1968, the movements of 1968 were very successful. And there was no social media then. There was nobody tweeting. Whereas now we have people tweeting 
Some movements are successful, like in Egypt. Some movements are not, like in Iran. So uh, all we can do is measure the fact that it helps people organize, and that's pretty much it. And I'm going to throw you a question. How They were successful when we look at the 1980s and particularly the Vietnam movement at the time. Um, why were they successful then? Well, probably the message, number one, society was changing, number two, uh, there was a, almost a, a backlash against kind of the, the mainstream that which was going on then, the counterculture. So there was a lot of things in play that helped those movements become successful. Over time, uh, in all societies, uh, conservative notions get a little bit more lenient. Tighter restrictions become less restrictive, most of the time, uh, especially in democratic societies, Western societies, society becomes more accepting. So that had a really big part in it. Uh, of course, the media went along. Uh, was media the only factor? Uh, one of the factors was media and how they were able to show certain things. They were able to show people on the streets getting hit with uh, water cannons. They were able to see that people getting tear gassed up. They were able to see all that. And that kind of relayed a message that made people sympathetic, that relayed an image that made people sympathetic towards the people in the social movement. And listen, when we talk about uh, people looking, uh, they're live there looking at these things going on. We have an instance in the Los Angeles riots where a camera, somebody uh, had a camera, took a picture of police brutality, the Rodney King, which brought about this uh, uh, major uh, riot. Many people say that um, um, uh, you have to have a democratic society in which social media, uh, social movements can flourish. What do you think of that? Well, if you believe the press is the watchdog of the people, then you need a democratic media that is willing to disseminate all types of opinions and viewpoints to really kick off social movements. If media is like it was in the 1960s, controlled by a certain race or a certain class of people, you don't have ideas that aren't uh, aren't prudent to this class of people. Uh, you don't have those I ideas and um, information spreading to the rest of the uh, American citizens. And do you think that the administration in a democratic society like social movements? They better, um, but do they like it or not? Who knows? Uh, probably the ones in power don't like it. Richard Nixon certainly didn't Richard like Nixon it. Richard Nixon didn't like it. Uh, the opposition likes it. Uh, you know, Barack Obama probably liked them beforehand. Now that he's in them, he's probably a little more conservative, probably thinking, well, less chatter we have, the less underground noise we have, the better. Uh, in, in, in reality, I think most presidents would rather not have see these social movements. Um, they'd like to be leading social movements. And certainly Barack Obama's, I think Obamacare is somewhat of a social movement, I guess. And he certainly used uh, in his elections, and even with this issue, uh, used social media. Well, the media doesn't have the information that the government has as well. So the media is more likely to present op opposing viewpoints when they don't have the information that the government might have in some cases. Or you know, if they do have the information the government has, they're more willing to spread that information around as opposed to opposing viewpoints. So. I think it depends on how open the government itself is. If they're open about their information, um, for example, uh, Bush Sr., if he, they're open about that information that they give out to the public, I don't think they would disagree that, uh, that democratic media is a good thing. It's only when they hide information for specific reasons, maybe political, maybe economic reasons, that they decide that they dislike the media, they dislike what the media would do to their administration. Okay, good. Any predictions on the future of social media and what may happen in the future? P predictions, oh, that's a tough one. I mean, social media is gonna obviously continue to grow. User-generated content is gonna continue to be a bigger factor in our daily lives. I'm interested in knowing what Twitter and Facebook will be like in five years or 10 years, if they'll even be around. They're already saying Facebook's getting outdated. The younger generation isn't using it as much. So really, it's uh, with technology growing exponentially, uh, it's interesting to see. I wish I could make a prediction, uh, but one thing I could probably guess is that it's probably not going to make us more energetic. It might make us lazier. Um, in Mexico recently, in 2012, 
um, the presidential elections there, there was a movement called I Am 132. And the, a lot of it was social media based because it was a college student thing. There was a lot of college students around that were saying that the media and the, one of the presidential candidates, the one who ended up winning, were kind of together. They were kind of in cahoots together. And so what ended up happening, researchers found, is that once the movement kind of died, it kind of got relegated to social media. So it turned into a lot of digital chatter, but not really any actual chatter. So that's kind of the concern. The, the more of a burden, not burden, that's not the right word, but the more of a factor it becomes in our lives, the more of an influence it comes in our lives, do we become just digital chatterboxes, or do we actually go out into the street still and hold up signs and march and yell? You know, it's going to be interesting to see. And I think social media will become what the, me what the mainstream commercial media was in the 1960s and 70s. They're going to become the watchdog for all the small issues that aren't as useful to mainstream media who have to pay bills. They're going to be uh, covering in the next year net neutrality. They're going to be covering small social issues that make a difference in people's lives, but that mainstream media can't afford to put on the air because it's just not profitable. Good. And one thing that comes to mind is this whole Occupy movement. Um, that seemed to, you know... Fizzle? Fizzle um, with all the social media. And I think a lot of people got aggravated with this whole movement. Any ideas about what happened there? I think it just blew up so quickly online over social media. It was the Wild West online. And I feel like uh, just as Brian mentioned earlier, that um, social media will go the way of traditional media and that uh, there will be more regulations with that and it'll cover more you know, issues that can't be covered in traditional media on the television, in the newspaper, on the radio. It's relative to you know, online issues because it is online and more people can access it and use it. So. Very good. So uh, social media and its role in social movements will be debated uh, as we see new technologies come on the floor. Thanks to our panel for joining us today on this important question of social movements and the use of social media. And it's going to be interesting in the future as new technology continues to change how people will use uh, this new technology to advance social movements. And thank you for joining us today on this look into the media and the social movements. It has been said that media are the thread which can be used to unravel the power of establishment. Was Jim Morrison correct? Whoever controls the media controls the mind. I'm Tony Fellow, and we'll see you on the next edition of World Press. <laughs>